Good morning, stand with us and we will sing There's Power in the Blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Since things are lost in its life-giving flow, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood. Good morning. It's good to see everyone after a very cold week that we've had, um, <laughs> but it's good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning. Uh, one is the Valentine's Banquet is this evening, tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, for the CIY Move fundraiser. Uh, there is child care provided if you need it. Is there anything else we need to announce about that for tonight? Okay. Yes, so please come. <laughs> okay. um, there are read Bible reading plans still back on the Welcome Center, if you have that also. And that is all the announcements I have, unless anybody else has any announcements, or if you have any prayer requests, be sure you be in prayer for those on the back of your bulletin for those specific prayer needs this coming week. Okay. All right, we'll stand up and greet one another in the name of the Lord. I'm glad you're here this morning.
please stand with us as we sing Days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, who lift your voice, is he here at Jubilee? And out of Zion till salvation comes. And these are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of grace. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet calls to lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. And out of Zion till salvation comes Behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun And the trumpet calls So lift your voice It's a year of jubilee And out of Zion till salvation comes There's no God like Jehovah, 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 there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. And the trumpet calls to lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee. And out of Zion till salvation comes, behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. The trumpet calls to lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. And out of Zion till salvation comes. Out of Zion till salvation comes. The splendor of the King, clothed in let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How
Psalms 91, verse 2, it says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. According to Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word for fortress is matzed, which means net, fastness, castle, defense, stronghold, or strong place. God is my strong place. He is my castle of defense. He is my stronghold and refuge. He is my net. I will rest in his power. I will rest in his strength. He is my stronghold and no one can defeat him. He is my fort. He covers me. He protects me. God shields me. I will put my trust in him who quiets the storm. No wave can crush him. No storm can defeat him. He is unstoppable. He is impenetrable. He is everlasting, and in him will I trust. He is my financial fortress. He is my emotional refuge. He is my strength in the middle of the storm. My faith will not waver. I will not fear. Though the enemy may come to trap me, I will find safety in you. I choose to put my trust in your hands. You are my safety net. You are my comfort and shield. I will say of the Lord, he is my rear guard and he protects me on every side. Favor goes before me. Mountains bow before you. Who shall stand before our great king? He is my rock, my fortress, my strength, and my song. No one can defeat him. And in John 1, verses 4 through 5, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Praise the Lord. Please bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that we can come together and praise your great and mighty name. We thank you that you are our fortress, that you are our fort, our refuge, our comfort, our care, our provider, and our protector. Dear Lord, we do put our trust and our eyes and our hope upon you. For you are the great physician, you're the great provider, you're the great all in all. And we thank you that no matter what we face in life, that you are the light and that darkness cannot overcome it. Thank you that you are our way maker, our promise keeper, and that you fulfill of all of our needs and take care of us. We give you all the praise and all the glory today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You are 
Good morning, and welcome to community time and worship service this morning. Today's reading is from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 through 27, and this comes from the Living Bible. It says, He is therefore exactly the kind of high priest we need, for he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin, undefiled by sinners, and to him has been given the place of honor in heaven. He never needs the daily blood of animal sacrifices, as other priests did, to cover over first their own sins and then the sins of the people. For he finished all sacrifices once and for all when he sacrificed himself on the cross. These scriptures, they remind us that 
The risen Jesus continues to be our sinless high priest and makes perpetual intercession before God in our behalf. And his continuous presence in heaven with the Father assures us that our sins have been paid for and forgiven. At the cross, Jesus had died and brought the sacrificial system to an end once and for all, which provided the per perfect completion of redemption of our sins. Communion is a time we remember the broken body and shed blood sacrifice that was provided at the cross for the atonement of our sins when we share the loaf and cup this morning. Let's bow in a word of prayer, please, for the blessing of the emblems. Dear any Father, we ask you to bless the loaf and cup this morning that represents the body and blood sacrifice that Jesus paid in our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Father, for providing us Jesus as the high priest that continues to intercede for us in the holiest of holies in the heavenly realm at your right hand. In Jesus' name we do pray this. Amen.
It's from uh, for Children's Church and Little, Little Explorers can go to Children's Church at this time. <clears throat> I was told of a story this morning. Hal and I died. I thought, go oh, good, this is great. And I said, don't worry. He says, well, at least we go to heaven. He says, yeah, we were, we were on our way to heaven. It was all uphill. He says, and he got really tired halfway up. And I said, sure, I had to drag you the rest of the way up too. He? he says, well, he says, you carried, you carried me on your back, he said. And I go, well, that's good. And then we get to the pearly gates and St. Peter opens the door and says, how it's so good to see you. Come on in. And he let him in and he says, you're going to have to leave your pack mule here. I thought, it's been how long since I've seen you, How, and this is the high that I get? Oh, just a pack mule. I knew my kids viewed me as a pack mule, haul this and haul that for them. But, man, Hal, I love you too, man. <laughs> it's good to see you. I'm glad you've been traveling safe. Just keep doing it, and I'll put up with a few more of those jokes, all right? So, uh, this morning, uh, it's good to see you all. It's so much better to have all of you here. As you all know, it was really cold last Sunday. In fact, when Walt was cleaning off the, uh, the parking lot, I knew it was really cold because he came in not once but twice to warm up. Now, that's got to be cold because there's been other Sundays he's done it, and he's done it all in one trip and didn't have to come in and to warm up. But uh, it is, what would we consider this, a heat wave today, so... I'm not quite ready to break out my shorts, but almost. But it's good to see you and not have to preach to just a camera and, and, and all that. So um, I'm taking it that everyone was safe and warm and survived, so it's good to see that. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 19 as we take a, continue in our series on encountering Jesus. But before we get started, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for today. Well, I thank you that today is almost the complete opposite of what last Sunday was, where last Sunday was just cold, miserable. Today it is warmer, even though the wind is blowing pretty good, but it is, it is warmer and much easier to get out and, and uh, safer for us to do so, to come here together to worship you uh, because, Father, you created us, because you love us, and because you sent your son to die on a cross for us. Father, we will come to worship you because we, uh, we thank you for everything you've done, because we love you. And Father, as we open up your word, Father, pray that you speak to us. Father, we pray that you open our, heart, our, our ears, our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to what you have to say to us today. So that way we can take what we learn and apply it to our lives. So we can be a, br- a bright light that shines so others can find you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. How many of you remember the story Zacchaeus? I think for most of us, if when we were in, you know, I think it's still a story that's told at least once, if not a hundred times in Sunday school, little explorers, children's church, all that. It is a story that we we were told often as kids, and it is, a memor- it is a memorable one because of the fact that Zacchaeus was not very tall. In fact, probably when I said mentioned the story of Zacchaeus, a lot of you probably even remember the song that you were taught as a kid, probably either in Sunday school or in children's church. You know that song that goes, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree where the Lord he wanted to see. Yeah, they just don't teach that. I don't know, do we still teach our kids that song today? But yeah, we sang that song, and I don't know if we'll ever forget that story because of that song. Or be able to think of this story and not think of that song. Zacchaeus had the fortune of being remembered primarily because of his less than impressive stature, because as the song says, he was a wee little man. That's just how most of us remember him. And unfortunately, sometimes we sell him a little short, so to speak, too. But Zacchaeus, like so, <laughs> one, Holly's the only one that got the little joke. Uh, how we're just telling your jokes from here on out. 
But Zacchaeus, like so many other people that we read about in the gospel, he experienced a life-changing encounter in Jesus. His story actually picks up in the book of Luke, immediately following the story of the two blind men that we took a look at last week. And like Zacchaeus himself, his story is rather short. So let's turn to Luke chapter 19 and read verses 1 through 10. Jesus was going through the city of Jericho. A man was there named Zacchaeus, who was a very important tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because he was too short to see over the crowd. He ran ahead to a place where Jesus would come, and he climbed a sycamore tree so he could see him. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus came down quickly and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to complain. Jesus is staying with a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times more. Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house today, because this man also belongs to the family of Abraham. The Son of Man came to find lost people and save them. The name Zacchaeus means the righteous one. But apparently Zacchaeus has not been living up to his namesake. Rather, he is known around town as a notorious sinner. Now, as a tax collector working for the Romans, most Jews would have considered Zacchaeus a traitor. But in the eyes of Jesus, Zacchaeus was a lost sinner in need of a Savior. And although Zacchaeus... Zacchaeus is generally known for being short of stature. This morning what I want to do is I want to highlight four qualities of Zacchaeus that he was not short on. <laughs> First, Zacchaeus was more than just a little curious. Jesus not only drew uh, decent folks and respectable citizens, but even tax collectors, street walkers, uh, notorious sinners were drawn to Jesus like a magnet. I'm not sure how Zacchaeus heard of Jesus, whether he just heard from a friend or a stranger and they happened to be talking about Jesus as, as Zacchaeus walked by. Or perhaps Matthew, a former tax collector himself, was one of Zacchaeus' friends. And just wondering if he, he was the one that told Zacchaeus about Jesus. Maybe Matthew had been praying for Zacchaeus. Now, the Bible doesn't give us an answer to these questions, but we do know that there's something about Jesus that really got Zacchaeus' curiosity. Because in Luke chapter 19, verse 4, it tells us that he was so compelled to see Jesus that he ran ahead to a place where Jesus would come. And he climbed a sycamore tree so he could see him. You see, it wasn't just enough for Zacchaeus to stand at the back of the crowd. It wasn't enough for Zacchaeus to make some makeshift telescope to see Jesus. It wasn't enough for Zacchaeus to just have someone uh, describe to him what Jesus looked like and what was going on around Jesus as Jesus passed by. No, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus with his very own eyes. So what did he do? He, he, he went out on a limb. Are you just trying to force the laugh down just to... <laughs> man? I, but yes, Zacchaeus, all dressed up in his work clothes, whether he was wearing something fancy like a, a, a thousand dollar suit and some fancy shoes, or I don't know, maybe he, he, he didn't dress up, but he, he shimmy up a, a tree in and, and hopes to see Jesus. So I think it bears, we need to ask our own selves, would we, would we do the same for Jesus today? Would we climb a tree? 
sit on a branch. For those who are maybe scared of heights, like myself, you know, we just climb up far enough, you know, up as high as we needed, and then just hang on for dear life to a branch so we wouldn't fall. Would we be willing to climb a tree, sit on a branch to see Jesus? In the fourth century, Augustine posed the following experiment. He said, imagine God saying to you, I'll make a deal with you if you wish. I'll give you anything and everything you ask. Pleasure, power, honor, wealth, freedom, even peace of mind and a good conscience. Nothing will be a sin. Nothing will be forbidden and nothing will be impossible to you. You will never be bored, and you will never die. But there is one catch. You will never see my face. Now, the first part of this proposition, I bet you we'd all be willing to uh, at least think about it. It's, it. it's appealing. We probably would even, might even been in a hurry to raise our hand. I mean, think about it. There's a part of us, a, a pleasure a loving part of us that would perk up at the thought of being without guilt. You know, endless delights. Uh, so we would be happy to raise our hands and volunteer for this experiment. And then we hear that last phrase, the here's the catch. We will never see his face. Would that cause you to pause? Would you hesitate to volunteer for this? The idea of never knowing the image of God, never ever beholding the presence of Christ, I think it's at this point, at this part of the bargain, it begins to lose its appeal to us. We begin to second think or think about this again second guess this and and I think that it's just a test to each of us it tells us something about our hearts it reveals to us a deeper a better part of us that longs to see God I believe Zacchaeus embraced this inner longing he was willing to climb a tree and to cling or to sit on a tree branch just to get a glimpse it's not meet Jesus it's just to get a glimpse of Jesus to see him I don't but you but I think that God rewards this kind of curiosity in fact James 4 8 says come near to God and God will come near to you I think that's just what happened to Zacchaeus Because he indulged his curiosity, Zacchaeus experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus. So his curiosity put him in a tree. And then, because of the the second point that I want to look at this morning, because he was more than just a little excited. This whole story gives us the impression that Zacchaeus was excited and enthusiastic about meeting Jesus. I mean, reading this passage and you, 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 you look at all the verbs that are in, the, in, in this passage, I think it makes you kind of tired. I mean, uh, I spent the better part of yesterday watching some basketball games. You know, Derek's te- the team that Derek and Josh are on, they, they played three games yesterday and I think Jason and I both agree we were tired just watching them run up and down the floor. So I think I can relate. I mean, you look at, at, at these verbs, you got ran and climbed and hurried. He, and then he came down, he welcomed, stood, said, will give, have cheated, will pay. All these verbs speak of a certain bounce to his step, maybe a wide smile on his face. And then we read in verse 6. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to a house in great excitement and joy. I don't know about you, but thinking about this and, and, and seeing his enthusiasm in his, it's, it's obvious to see his excitement. And what are we? We're, we're 2,000 years later. How far is it to Jericho? 10,000 miles? It's obvious. 
obvious to see his excitement. I want to ask you, as I ask myself, when was the last time I got excited about Jesus? When was the last time you really got excited about meeting, seeing Jesus or about Jesus because you were going to go to church, go to a study? I remember as a kid, church coming up and going, ah, oh, that's my one day to sleep in. Not real excited. Cartoonist Doug Hall once pictured a church secretary delivering a phone message to a pastor. And the caption read, A man from Ripley's Believe It or Not wants a picture of someone on fire for the Lord. Unfortunately, enthusiasm and excitement are a lot of times the exception, not the norm for Christians today. But an enthusiastic faith is what makes the difference between pew warmers and prayer warriors. Between Sunday morning Christians and Soldiers for Christ. Years ago, the internationally acclaimed director, director Eugene Ormandy, while he, while he was conducting the Philadelphia Sympathy Orchestra, he, he threw himself so thoroughly into the performance that he dislocated his shoulder. Now, I don't know about you, but that, I had to stop and think about that one, and I read, read about that and just kind of watched them guys that's a lot of throwing that arm in, in there and to dislocate your shoulder. That's enthusiasm. And I believe that's how Zacchaeus felt about meeting Jesus. The thought of encountering Jesus at church or in our own personal prayer time or at the dinner time or, or just in your daily routine, it ought to be exciting for us too. What, looking forward to seeing when Jesus interrupts our day. How many times do we, when Jesus interrupts our day, do we just whine and complain about it? Instead of waiting to see what kind of blessing we can be to someone else or even they can be to us because we get to have an encounter with Jesus. H.W. Arnold once said, the worst bankruptcy in the world is the man who has lost his enthusiasm. Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus with excitement and joy. And these two words ought to define the life of each and every believer. Now, despite his small stature, Zacchaeus was more than a little curious. Second, he was more than a little excited. Third, he was more than a little charitable. Now, prior to meeting Jesus, Zacchaeus was all about the taking. Caesar permitted these freelance IRS agents to tax just about anything. I mean, your boat, the fish you caught, your house, the, your crops, and so forth. Whatever it was that you did and, and, and whatever they wanted. As long as Caesar got his cut, these tax collectors could overcharge as much as they wanted to line their pockets with the leftover taxes. They could tack on 10, 20, 30, 50, or even 100% if they wanted. Now, the thing is, is if anyone refused to pay up, they could dispatch a cohort of Roman soldiers to do their dirt, dirty work. So in other words, they literally had a license for extortion. But then Zacchaeus met Jesus. In verse 8 of our passage says that Zacchaeus stood up and said to Jesus, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. You see, meeting Jesus transformed Zacchaeus into a very charitable man. You could call him a little man with a big heart. And not many people are willing to give half of what they have, half of their wealth to, to give and give it to the poor. How many is ready to join that group? We're just not. This kind of generosity is a hallmark, or can be the hallmark, for those whose lives 
have been changed by Jesus. Life's no longer about how much you get, but how much you can give. We all know that the Bible has a lot to say about giving. Deuteronomy 15.10 says, Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Proverbs 22.9 says, A generous man will give himself... A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This passage reminds me of a mom who wanted to teach her daughter a a moral lesson. So she gave her daughter a quarter and a dollar. And she told her, put whatever one you want to in the collection plate. You get to decide. So when they come out later, when they were coming out of church, the mother looked at her daughter and asked her which amount she had given to the Lord. Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the dollar, but then the, uh, the guy who gave the offering meditation said that God loves a cheerful, a cheerful giver, so I figured I better give the quarter. We chuckle about that, but because she was a whole lot more cheerful about giving a quarter than she would be about the dollar, but how much are we like that? I think most of us would be a whole lot happier giving a quarter than a dollar, so to speak. See, we're often content in giving the bare minimum. We'll drop some spare change in the collection plate and then pat ourselves on the back as if we did a good deed for for that day. I mean, I don't think it's just necessarily money that we do that. We also do it with our time. According to one study, the average churchgoer contributes between one and a half to two and a half percent of their income to the Lord. And again, I think we do a lot of that. We do the same thing with our time. But I think in this story, Zacchaeus puts us all to shame. So my question for you again this morning, another question for you is how cheerfully do you give? Not just your time or not just your money, but also your time. I think cheerful and generous giving is a byproduct of realizing just how much we received in Jesus. When we realize what a treasure it is to have Jesus in our life, we can give joyfully to the church and to those who are in need. And I believe that's what Zacchaeus did here in this story. His encounter with Jesus made him more than just a little charitable. Fourth, finally, Zacchaeus was more than a little changed. Zacchaeus' enthusiasm and generosity were simply an outward indication of what was going on inwardly with him. The real transformation took place in Zacchaeus' heart. You see, before meeting Jesus, Zacchaeus was a sinner at heart. According to his neighbors in verse 7, it it says that he was a notorious sinner. Now, if you would combine the greed of an embezzling executive with the presumption of a hokey television evangelist, throw in the audacity of an ambulance-chasing lawyer, stir in a pinch of a pimp's morality, and finish it off with a drug peddler's code of ethics, what would you have? A first century tax collector. Now, to be honest, I think we're painting, a pretty ra- painting with a pretty ra- large brush here because not every tax collector was as slimy as the next one. But according to the Jews, these guys were about as crooked as a corkscrew. So when Zacchaeus demonstrated extreme generosity, Jesus responded by announcing in verses 9 and 10 that salvation has come to this house today. 
For, the, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Jesus made seeking and saving lost souls his mission. And that's still his mission today. He's still looking for lost souls. And spiritually speaking, we're all a little short. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So no one measures up to God's high standards. But despite our shortcomings, I think Zacchaeus demonstrates that none of us are beyond saving. You see, it doesn't matter who you are, what your reputation may be, or how you've lived in the past. Jesus came to seek and save spiritually lost people, to transform sinners into saints. He found Zacchaeus. The question is, has he found you? When a day begins, we never know how it's going to end. Sometimes we plan it out and we have a good idea how it's going to end. But a lot, a lot of us have our days interrupted. On a, you know, and for Zacchaeus, this day ended in a joyful fellowship with the Son, son of God. Now, he may have been a, a little guy, but he was more than just a little curious, more than just a little excited, more than a little charitable, and more than just a little changed. Thanks to Jesus, Zacchaeus was now a new man with a whole new life ahead of him. So this morning, as we close, if you're curious about Jesus, or maybe even excited to meet him, I'd love to introduce you to him. I'm sure our, if you, and, and I'm sure our elders would be more than happy to talk to you about Jesus too. Whether you're here this morning or joining us online, we want you, we, we'd love to have a chance to talk with you. Whether it's you coming forward or giving us a call, stopping in at the office and meeting with me or whatever it may be, we want to, we'd love to talk to you about Jesus and share how he has changed our lives and what he can do for you. But I also have a challenge for you this morning. Now, whether you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet and been baptized in, into Him, we want to encourage you, we want to challenge you to draw near to Jesus today and just see how He draws Himself to you or draws you to Him. Are you willing to go out on a limb? I hope you are. Because I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for, for Zacchaeus and his excitement, his willingness, his desire to meet you, to want to get to know you, his willingness to be changed by you, to do things your way. Father, I pray that uh, we look at Zacchaeus in a different light. He might have been a little man, but he had a big heart. And he wanted to do, he wanted to change. And he knew that you were the only one that could change, change him. And so, Father, I pray. I pray that's our desire, is to have a heart like Zacchaeus. To know that life's not going the, well, the way we want it or going to end up the way we want it to if we do things always our, our way that we need to have an encounter with you. We need to start doing things differently because you're the only way that our lives can improve, that we can experience the things that we want, want to experience, a meaningful life, experience love, feel the impact of being forgiven, the joy that comes with feeling grace and mercy and forgiveness, just the security we feel when we're walking with you because of who you are, that no matter what's going on around us, you're there, and you're going to ta take us. And Father, I pray. I pray that you continue to draw us to you. Those that don't know you, I pray, Father, that you will draw them to you. And if you need to use one of us as a pack mule, so to speak, 
we'd be willing to do that. Because, Father, we don't want anyone to go through life not experiencing what we have experienced in you. The joy and the grace and the peace and everything we experience in you that you bring to us because of what you have done for us. We want others to know that same feeling. And to be able to go to heaven and spend eternity with you. So, Father, pray, I pray that our desire is to be willing to be used by you to help others find you. Draw us close to you as we seek to draw close to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. something that we naturally do. He keeps us alive. We don't have a hand in it at all. Just think, what are we, why aren't we living our lives for him? 
why aren't we doing everything we possibly can to do whatever is pleasing to him, to love him with every fiber of our being? We are so desperately lost without him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being our God, for loving us so much that when we mess things up, when we sinned, you already had a plan in place. You saved us. Not because of who we are, not because of what we have, but because of who, who, who you are and because you love us. And you want a relationship with us. You want us to be home in heaven with you. So you gave us the opportunity. And then you are the one that calls us to you. So we can be reconciled with, with, with you. We can only be found because you find us, not we find you. And Father, I'm so thankful for that. Because we wouldn't know where to begin to look. But you do. And you know, you, know, you know right where to find us. And I'm so thankful for that. Father, I pray now that we will be, just show our appreciation and our love for you by willing to be your people who are willing to go out and look for lost souls and to draw them to you so they can experience your love and your grace and your, your forgiveness to be reconciled with you so they can spend eternity with, with, with you too. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. Working power in the precious blood.